This study in the New Testament book of John is offered for the edification of all students of God's Word by spiritandtruth.org. Pastor Andy Woods of Sugarland Bible Church will be our instructor during this study. It is our prayer that this study will deepen your understanding of the Bible and allow you to draw closer in your relationship with God through His Son, Jesus Christ. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. John 17.3 Now let's begin our time of study in this important and fascinating book of the Bible. Well, good morning, everyone. If uh, we could take our Bibles and open them to John 15 and verse 16. Gospel of John, chapter 15 and verse 16. Try to look at verses 16 and, as time permits today, verse 17. Uh, The title of our message is The Benefits of Loving God. And uh, as you're turning there, just a couple of announcements. The next uh, three weeks, um, I'm not going to be here. And if you come here and see me not here, it's not because you missed the rapture or something like that. Um, my wife and I have had a the op- have give, been given the opportunity to take a tour to the Lone Star State. I'm not talking about Texas, I'm talking about Israel. And when that opportunity came up, I said we need to take uh, advantage of that. So we will be gone the 8th and the 15th. And I'm continuing on into Greece. My wife will be coming back though. But I will also be gone the 22nd. And typically when I go uh, leave like this, I get a speaker from the College of Biblical Studies to fill the pulpit. Uh, I can't use any of those guys because most of them are going to be over there with me. So Dr. Shockley is going to be there with another group and so forth. So I said, Lord, uh, what, what, what should I do? And he said, well, you need to read your Bible. And I opened my Bible and it opened up to 1 Timothy 3, verse 2, just magically. And it says there in 1 Timothy 3, verse 2, an elder must be apt to teach. And so I said, gosh, maybe we should get some of our elders to teach. And so uh, Ed Alstead graciously agreed to sub in for me. He is uh, going to be teaching uh, what I consider to be a very important subject, dispensational clarity, part one and part two on June 8th and June 15th from Ephesians 3, verses 1 through 10. If you can understand the subjects of dispensations, you will probably understand the whole Bible. So it's the keys that unlock the whole Scripture to you. And it's a point of view that you're probably not getting Sunday morning since I have a tendency to gravitate on one verse, but he's going to be unlocking the whole picture for you as the Spirit of God uh, enables him. He's taught this for us in Sunday school, and it was extremely well received. And so I encourage you to take advantage of that. And then I turned in my Bible to Acts 7, and I discovered that one of the deacons was preaching, a guy named Stephen, And so I asked one of our deacons, uh, Will Miller, he's going to sub in on June 22nd. Now, of course, Stephen was stoned to death when (laughs) he finished his sermon, so we're trusting that won't happen to Will. But he's going to be dealing with a fresh look at fellowship, which goes really well with what we've been talking about in the upper room from 1 John 1, 1 through 4. And Will senses a very strong calling to the ministry. And so one of the neat things a local church can do is to give a young person um, an opportunity. Uh, I received an opportunity like that 
from a man named Norm Dalton when I was about 22 years old. And I was shaking like a leaf, but I got into that pulpit and started teaching, and I discovered that God had a calling on my life to do this. So I hope you'll look at this as not just a uh, boring exercise to go through. These are actually really significant things that God can use in the life of a person to kind of fortify them in uh, their calling in God. One of the things, very sadly, before we get into our passage, I'll bring to your attention because I have brought it to this church's attention for a couple of Sundays, is the equal rights so-called ordinance um, that we hoped would not pass because essentially what it does is it criminalizes Christian convictions, as I've explained. That did pass the Houston City Council. And the very sad thing about it is the calls that came in to the city council members as well as the emails that came in were about 80% against. And so in essence they ignored the will of the people and they passed it anyway. And this is another testimony as to why Americans are so frustrated with their government. We don't seem to be represented the government seems to be beholden to someone's ideology or to a well-financed special interest group. So that did pass. And fortunately, in America, we have other options. So the pastors in this city are collecting signatures to overturn that ruling. And so I would just submit that to you for your consideration. I'll give you more information on it as I learn more about it. Anyway, something to really be in prayer for. We are in the book of John, and we find ourselves in chapter 15. We are in a section called the Upper Room Discourse, where Jesus, in essence, has these 11 disciples huddled in the upper room, and he is revealing to them truths, truths that they will need for the age of the church, which is on the horizon. It's a section that is called fruit-bearing or the vine and the branches. He uses a metaphor to describe his relationship to them as a branch connected to the vine. They are the branches. He is the vine. And as they stay connected to him by way of fellowship, fruit will come forth from their lives naturally. And then, beginning in verses 9 through 17, as we started looking at that paragraph last week, and hopefully we'll finish it up this morning, he tells them to, continuing on with the metaphor, to abide in his love. And what he describes is why we should abide in his love, how to abide in his love, And then the benefits that will come to pass naturally in our lives as we abide in him. He begins to describe, verse 9, the reality of God's love. God's love is a reality. The Father loves the Son, and the Son loves us. The love of God is an eternal reality. It's as eternal as the Trinity itself. So we are loved by God. And yet we are given an invitation, verse 9, to abide in that love. And one of the things that's very confusing is people get uh, very confused about this. And they believe that this is an invitation for salvation. This is not an invitation for salvation. The individuals that Jesus is speaking to here in the upper room, (laughs) these 11 are already saved. He is dealing not with the subject of salvation. He is dealing with the subject of staying in fellowship with him. And it's a command to abide in his love. He gives us the recipe for doing that in verse 10. The recipe is obedience. How do we say that we are abiding in the love of God? We, in essence, are obeying him under the power that the Spirit of God gives us. Again, this is not an invitation for salvation. This is an invitation for growth in the Christian life. And then he describes the benefits that come into our lives as we abide in his love 
by obeying his commandments. In other words, if abiding is not something that's automatic, then what are the good things that we can expect to happen if we do abide? And he begins to articulate these benefits in verses 11 through 17, things that we talked about last week, such as joy, the ability to love others, verse 12, friendship with God. We had a chance to look at what it means to be a friend of God last week in verses 13 through 15. Being a friend of God is more than simply being a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. Only as a person begins to grow in their depth and intimacy with the Lord, only as they consistently abide in His love by obeying His commandments under His power, do we then become friends of God. And friendship has privileges such as insight into things. And we spiritual things particularly, and we saw that last time in verses 13 through 15. And what I would like to describe for you today in the brief time that we have is four additional benefits of abiding in the love of God. If abiding in the love of God, if fellowship with God is not automatic for every Christian, then at some point we would expect the Scripture to explain here are the benefits for abiding in God's love. And what Christ gives to us, first to these eleven, and then indirectly throughout to us by way of analogy, are four powerful benefits that begin to take place in our lives as we make it a habit of cultivating intimacy with Him. The first benefit that we begin to experience is we begin to fulfill the purpose for which we exist. Every single human being is born into this world with a purpose. And it's so sad that many times we live our whole lives without understanding our purpose and we fail to press into our intended design. We have a particular purpose. He begins to unfold this purpose, which existed before the foundations of the earth, in verse 16. Notice what he says. You did not choose me. But I chose you. Now, how did disciples pick their rabbi in the first century world? Well, the disciples picked the teacher or the rabbi that they liked the best. The one that they learned the most from. And so it was not the rabbi selecting the pupils. It was the pupils or the students selecting their teacher. And that happens today on college campuses. Students will gravitate towards the teacher that they get the most out of. They'll take all of that teacher's classes and electives. And so it's largely the students that are picking the teacher. But you notice that Jesus says in the relationship that we have with him, it's the other way around. He says there in verse 16, you did not choose me, which is the norm, but I chose you. Jesus, we learn, had picked these 11. It is very interesting to me that when you go back to the beginning of Christ's ministry, you get this idea that the apostles or the disciples had picked Christ. You get this impression in Matthew 4 and verse 20 related to the calling of Peter and Andrew. It says immediately they, that's a decision they made, they, Peter and Andrew, left their nets and followed him. They are the ones making the choice. They are gravitating towards Jesus Christ. And then all of a sudden, about three years later, Jesus tells them, oh, by the way, guys, you didn't pick me, but I picked you. So at the beginning of the Bible, they picked Jesus, but at the end of his ministry, we learn that he had picked them. And this raises a very difficult theological conundrum. People have wrestled with this one all of their days. Do we choose God, or does God choose us? And I think the right answer to that question is yes. Because clearly in the Scripture... 
you can see both. Harry Ironside put it this way, you enter heaven and there is a gate that says all who will, all who seek to enter, come through this gate. And then you go through the gate and you look back on the other side of the gate and inscribed on the wall, it says, welcome you who are chosen from the foundations of the earth. Do we pick God or does God pick us? And the answer is yes. It's very similar to a marriage. In a marriage, and of course in the book of Ephesians, chapter 5, verses 22 through 33, our relationship to the Lord is analogized of a bride to the groom. When you got married, did you pick your spouse or did your spouse pick you? I hope the answer to that question is yes. I hope both of you selected each other. And that is how it works with our Lord. And people uh, get very uh, uptight about this. And they say, well, if God chose me, how can I be free enough to choose God? How does that work? And the answer to that is I have studied this issue my whole life and I can't figure it out. It is one of the great mysteries of the universe. It shows me that an omniscient God outside of our time dimension limitations authored this book. You see, there was a time in my life where I became very frustrated with these things in the scripture that I could not resolve. But I have kind of grown now to the point where I let loose ends be loose ends. Knowing that my mind is just a small peanut in comparison to an all-knowing God. And it shows me now that this book must have come from a source beyond human intelligence because a human author writing on his own volition and power and limitations never could have come up with such an idea. But you'll notice that not only they were chosen, but they were chosen to do something. Again, verse 16, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you would go and bear fruit and that your fruit would remain. We are chosen unto salvation, but there's more to it than that. We are chosen to manifest fruit for God. We are appointed for the purpose of bearing fruit. Even the fruit that we will bear for Him is chosen and appointed. I'm reminded very much of the book of Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10 which says, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. We are not saved by good works, but we are to a very large extent saved unto good works. And so when we begin to bear fruit as believers by following the recipe and the invitation in verses 9 and 10 by staying in fellowship with him and consequently the fruit comes, what is happening? We are living for the purpose for which we exist. And there is nothing more fulfilling and meaningful in life than fulfilling your design, whatever your design is, because we are appointed not just to be saved. That would be wonderful enough, but we are appointed to bear fruit. And how sad it is that so many believers reach the end of their life in Christ on this earth without understanding this concept, regretting that I wish I had borne fruit for the Lord the way the Lord wanted me to bear fruit for Him. How many people get to the end of their lives and they make this simple statement, if I had it to do all over again, I would be this way or that way. And the problem with life is there is no do-overs. The book of James chapter 4 and verse 14 tells us this, that this life is like mist that appears just for a little while and then it's gone. And yet we have this brief period of time to, as we'll see in a minute, make eternal investments for God. I'm reminded of the businessman who once quipped, I have spent my whole life climbing the ladder of success only to discover that the ladder was leaning against the wrong wall. 
how tragic it is to get to the end of one's life with great regrets. And yet, if we will simply follow this invitation and this recipe and manifest fruit for God, we discover that we are fulfilling the purpose for which God allowed us to come into existence physically and spiritually. And as a result, benefit number two, not only do we find our purpose, but as has been alluded to a moment ago, we begin to manifest fruit. You see that there in verse 16. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you would go and bear fruit and that your fruit would remain. Notice uh, these very interesting words here. Notice, first of all, this word fruit. When Jesus throws out this word fruit, what in the world is he talking about? He is not talking about the positional truths that we receive, spiritually speaking, the moment we trust Christ. According to Lewis Berry Chafer's organization of these truths based on the Scripture, there are 30 three items that you possess the moment you trust Christ. Those take place largely on the inside. They are invisible. They primarily benefit us. And they are automatic. Jesus is dealing with 11 men in the upper room who had already experienced those positional truths. What he is talking about here is an entirely different matter. Fruit, on the other other hand, is something on the outside, like a tree bearing fruit. Something that you can tangibly see. It's, it's visible. And when the fruit comes forth, it is beneficial to others beyond the person bearing that fruit. Fruit, as we have said many times, is not automatic in the life of every child of God. If it was automatic in the life of every child of God, why would there be a command to abide in His love, verse 9 and verse 10, obey Him, verse 10, so that fruit may come forth. If every believer bore fruit, those commands are unnecessary. Examples of fruit would be Bible study, evangelism, manifesting the fruit of the Spirit in terms of godly character, prayer, service, use of spiritual gifts, financial stewardship, generosity, And the list can go on and on. Fruit would encompass anything that is beneficial to the life of another. In other words, God has saved you, not just to bless you, but to be a blessing. I am reminded of the calling of Abraham in Genesis 12. God gave Abraham, whose name at that point was Abram, blessings. But he was very clear in Genesis 12 and verse 3 when he said this, Through you, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. In other words, I have blessed you, Abram, so you can be a blessing. The great design of our lives is to be used by God in such a way that we can be a blessing to other people. You'll notice in verse 16, he mentions uh, another phrase here. He uses the word bear fruit. You'll notice that we are not to produce fruit, we are to bear fruit. Producing fruit is this idea where we are responsible for the production of the fruit. And many Christians live their lives just this way. They know that they're supposed to be doing something significant for God, and so they manufacture in the power of the flesh or in human energy service for the Lord. That is producing fruit. Fruit, But you'll notice the Scripture is very clear that we are not to produce fruit, we are to bear fruit. Bearing fruit is an entirely different concept where the production of the fruit does not rest with us. The responsibility, on the other hand, that does rest with us is to abide in the vine. Abide in His love. And as we do that very simple thing, the fruit that God wants to bring forth from our lives comes to pass organically, serendipitously, coincidentally, accidentally from the human point of view. An orange tree or an orange branch does not concentrate on, pardon the pun, orange concentration, just thought of that, 
does not concentrate on producing oranges. All that branch does is stay connected to the nurturing sap of the tree and the oranges that are supposed to come forth will come to pass spontaneously. And so Christianity is far more simple than what we have turned it into. In our works righteousness mindset, we begin to falsely assume that the work of God rests on our shoulders. And may I just say to you that is not the case. And in fact, if you are trying to live your life under that, you will be very discouraged as a Christian because you are bearing a burden that God never never gave you to bear. He simply tells us to stay connected to Him by way of fellowship and the fruit that God wants to bring forth will come to pass. There's another interesting word here. It's the word go. Uh, Hupago. Go. John 20 and verse 21, Jesus later would say these words to these 11. He would say, Peace be with you as the Father has sent me, I also send you. The fruit that these eleven would bear is not simply in remaining there in the upper room, but is in going forth beyond what we would call the four walls of the church, as even we had a missionary speaker this morning talking about his ministry out beyond the four walls of the church, out where the unbelievers are, out in a hostile world system, which Jesus will begin to articulate in John 15 and verse 18. We are to go. And it is astonishing to me how these men did exactly what the Lord told them to do. He told them to abide in Him and He told them to go. And when we track the paths of these eleven, where the eleven went, it is astonishing what they did for God. They did not do it through human power. They did it through simply cultivating intimacy with Him. But they abided and they went. Most of these men were uh, martyred for the work or the cause of Christ. James, the son of Alphaeus, went to Jerusalem. Simon, the zealot, went to Jerusalem. James, the son of Zebedee, was killed in Judea. And you can find a record of his martyrdom in Acts 12 and verse 2. To my knowledge, he was the first of the eleven to be martyred. Thaddeus, one of the eleven, went to a place called Mesopotamia, which is modern-day Iraq. It's that area between the rivers, between the Euphrates and the Tigris River. Meso means middle, Potamia means rivers. Peter went to that same area as well. He wrote about it in 1 Peter 5 and verse 13, how he went to Babylon. And according to tradition... Peter finally went to Rome, and it's there in Rome that Peter met his death. Matthew went to uh, Parthia, which is modern-day Tehran. John, and I think this was mentioned by our missionary speaker, went to Asia Minor. And then he was marooned for a brief period of time off the coast of Asia Minor on a little island called Patmos. And there he received the apocalypsis or the revelation. And according to tradition, he was released from Patmos and went back to Ephesus where he was ministering over churches in that day and consequently met his death there in Ephesus. Philip went to eastern Turkey. Thomas went to India. Bartholomew went to India. Andrew I like that name, by the way. Andrew went to the Ukraine, to Russia, to Greece. And by the way, at the bottom of the screen is the website where I got all of these from. I'm sort of uh, reluctant to use information from the Internet, but this website was different because it provided the primary source documentation as to how we know these apostles went to where they went. In other words, this prophecy that the Lord gave in the upper room, abide in me and go, it is astonishing what the Lord did through these individuals. I had a youth pastor that put it this way, one plus God is a majority. And we look at these tasks that God has given us and we say, Lord, how can I do this? And the Lord says, you're right, you can't do it. 
But if you abide in me and go to where I tell you, the fruit will come forth spontaneously. You'll also notice there in John 15 and verse 16, he says, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you would go and bear fruit. Now watch this, that your fruit would remain. The the fruit that the Lord seeks to bring forth in our lives is fruit which abides, fruit which endures, fruit which lasts. Now, many people ask me, do I believe in global warming? Yes, I do. Second Peter 3 and verse 10 says this, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with the roar, and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat, and the earth and its works will be burned up. I believe in global warming in that sense. God is going to take this entire earth and burn it, destroy it. People say to me, do you believe in the Big Bang? Yes, I do, but I believe the Big Bang is at the end, not the beginning. (laughs) And so, consequently, we have to understand that we are living in a world that's marked. Its end is at hand. And yet, what the Scripture tells us is that there are two things that are going to pass from this life into the next. There are only two things that are going to survive the burning process. And it is, number one, the souls of men and women. The book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 3 and verse 11, tells us that God has set eternity into the hearts of men. Daniel 12 and verse 2. Matthew 25, verse 46. Too many verses to read today indicates that the human soul, when it was created, was created to be eternal, to last forever from the time in which it was created. All human beings, whether they're believers or not, will be alive somewhere a hundred years from now, five hundred years from now, a thousand years from now, a million years from now, a billion years from now, and so forth. The souls of people will last. The second thing that will make it through this burning process is the Word of God. Because the Bible says in Isaiah 40 and verse 8, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the Word of our God stands forever. Jesus in Matthew 24 and verse 35 says, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. If the only things that are going to make it from this life into the next are the souls of people and the Word of God, should we not take that as a barometer concerning where we put our time, energy, and investment? We so easily are distracted, particularly in American society, into side things that really will not stand the test of fire. And the Bible is telling us, just as surely as I am standing here, that this world will dissolve, but the souls of people will last, and so will His Word. Are you invested into the souls of people? And are you invested into this book? Because those are the only two things that are going to make it. I remember the movie Titanic where they were, as the Titanic was going, going down, worried about the music rearranging the deck chairs and foolish things of that nature, not fully understanding that the ship was going down. That is the biblical position. The ship is sinking. The world is about to be dissolved. And yet two things are going to make it from this life into the next. I remember even as a small child, my parents would take me to a certain restaurant, and it was a beautiful restaurant, And what they did is they took a giant block of ice and through great mastery as we were eating, they could sculpt things out of this giant block of ice. Beautiful things. They would sculpt sometimes an anchor. Sometimes they would sculpt a bunny. Sometimes they would sculpt a human figure. All sorts of very attractive things. But I remember even as a small child looking at that, watching that man chip and chisel and work and sweat 
to create a masterpiece. I remember as a small child being frustrated with that because I recognized that all of that man's efforts were temporary. Because the temperature at some point would eventually get its way, the ice block and the beautiful structure would melt away, and all of the things that that man had done were temporary. That is the type of picture that the Bible wants us to have. And we need to invest our lives, invest our time the right way. Jesus wants us to bear fruit which will last. By the way, you might remember John 15 and verse 6 where he talked about the branch being thrown into the fire. I would encourage you to go back and listen to the sermon that we did just on that verse, John 15 and verse 6. And when we were there, I said it's not describing hell the way many people take this. It is describing the fire. One of the better possibilities is the great fire that is coming to our works at an event called the Bema Seat Judgment of Christ. 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 15 says, If any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet as through fire. The biblical reality for the New Testament Christian is that we all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ, not so that we are judged. We have already been judged. Our sin has already been judged through what Jesus did for us. And we have trusted in that. We will not be put through a fire, but our works will be put through a fire. Everyone is building on the foundation of Christ, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3, verses 9 through 15. And yet some of the things that we do for Christ are wood, hay, and stubble. And what do those three things have in common? They all burn up, don't they? They're all combustible. Conversely, there are other things that we do for Christ that are analogized to gold, silver, and costly stones. What do those things have in common? They are non-combustible. The combustible are things that we do for Jesus as we are disconnected to Him. Religiosity. Human effort. Human energy. Human activity. All done through a vine that has been, excuse me, a branch that has been disconnected from the vine and consequently is not generating fruit that will last. But the things that we do under His power and under His resources through an abiding, intimate relationship with God, that is the eternal fruit that will last. That is the gold the silver, and the costly stones. And that will survive the fire that is coming to test all of our works at this event called the Bema Seat Judgment of Christ. And how we need to think about the Bema Seat Judgment of Christ. We need to be aware of it because that is the tremendous tool that the Spirit of God has given us to motivate our lives in the present. Are the things we do for God built on human energy and power? They will not be recognized when that fire does its work. But the fruit that comes forth through a vibrant fellowship and intimacy with Him will survive. Jesus wants us to bear fruit that will last. It is fascinating to me how these 11 people, most of them we would look at as unqualified to do anything for God, bore such significant fruit that here we are, on a different continent, 2,000 years later, benefiting from their ministry. In fact, one of those guys in that upper room was a guy named John, and how we have been blessed through John's book. John bore fruit that lasted, and that is the design of God for all of us. Why abide in the love of God? We, number one, fulfill our purpose. Number two, we become fruit bearers. There is a third thing or a third benefit that comes our way as a result of of abiding 
in the love of God. Notice, if you will, John 15 and verse 16. Once again, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you would go and bear fruit and that your fruit would remain. Notice the end of the verse. So that whatever you ask of my father in my name, he may give it to you. The third benefit of abiding in the love of God is a prayer life that has power. A prayer life that is effective. A prayer life that shakes the heaven and the earth. Jesus described this type of prayer life earlier, you'll recall, in John 15 and verse 7. He says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. One of the things that's very interesting that happens to us when we make the priority of our life not what we do for God, but intimacy with God, is His Word begins to take more of a dominance in our lives. His very words begin to abide in us as we are abiding in Him. We have an appetite for His Word, a hunger for His Word. And guess what happens when we start to know His Word? As we start to know His Word, we start to know His will. And people today are seeking for God's will. May I just say to you, it's been revealed. It's all here. This is the only book that you will find the will of God disclosed or revealed. And the better we know the will of God, the better we know how to pray. Let me tell you something about God. God is not interested in answering prayer requests that are outside of his will. John, who wrote another book in 1 John 4, 5 and verse 14, says this is the confidence which we have before him that if we ask anything according to his what? His will, he hears us. James 4 verses 2 and 3 puts it this way. You do not have because you do not ask. And when you ask, you do not receive because you ask that you may spend it on your pleasures with wrong motives. You ask amiss. I remember as a new Christian asking God for this and asking God for that and being frustrated because the hand of God never seemed to move. And the reason I was frustrated is because I was experiencing unanswered prayer. And the reason I was experiencing unanswered prayer is I didn't know His will. And the reason I didn't know His will is I didn't know His word. But becoming an abider in the Lord Jesus Christ, His words abiding in us, suddenly our minds are illuminated to His priorities, not our own. And I began to pray within those parameters. And I watched the Lord over and over again answer prayer, answer prayer, Answer prayer because I was no longer asking amiss. We know his word, we know his will. If we know his will, we know how to pray. If we know how to pray, we see our prayers answered because God is not obligated to answer prayers that are outside of his will. You'll notice also very carefully in verse 16, whatever you ask of my father in my name. You might recall some Sundays back we talked about this in John 14 and verse 13 where Jesus said, whatever you ask in my name, that I will do so that my Father may be glorified in the Son. How much confusion exists in the minds of the typical Christian through this little expression, in my name. I had been confused about this for years. I looked at it as a verbal formula. If I just asked and tacked on at the end in Jesus' name, that's the formula that works. And may I just say to you that that is not at all what Jesus is talking about. Asking in his name means praying for his priorities. Praying for his desires. Praying for the things that please the heart of of Jesus, no less than Charles Ryrie in the Ryrie Study Bible puts it this way regarding John 14 and verse 13. In my name, this is not a formula to be tacked to the end of prayers, 
but rather it means praying for the same things that the Messiah would desire to see accomplished. What does God want to see accomplished? He wants the gospel to go over the whole world. Is that our prayer? What does God want accomplished? He wants the nation of Israel, when we study Romans 11, to come back to faith. Do you pray for that? He wants you to pray for your daily provision. Do we pray for that? He wants His name to be exalted in the entire earth when His kingdom comes. Do you regularly pray, Thy kingdom come? Because that's what He wants. And we could go on and on with list after list. He wants Christians to put aside their silly bickering and territorial wars. And he wants the body of Christ united around truth so that we can go forth and pursue divine priorities. Do we pray for that? Do we pray that silly argumentations amongst Christians would stop? Because that's what God wants. I'm not talking about arguments that are significant because truth is at stake. I'm talking about personality squabbles that damage the life of churches all over this nation. Sadly, some of those squabbles even take place right in our own midst and siphon God's people away from His heart and His priorities. Is that our prayer life? And how do we know how to pray anyway? Paul says in 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 16, but we have the mind of Christ. We have His mind because we have His Word. Romans 12 and verse 2 talks about how we should not be conformed to the pattern of the world, but our minds should be renewed and transformed because we are in His Word. As that happens, we have the mind of Christ. We have the desires of Christ. And that informs us regarding how to pray in Jesus' name. Why abide in the love of God? Number one, we fulfill our purpose. Number two, we bear fruit that will last. Number three, our prayer life takes on new effectiveness and fervency and power. And then finally, number three, and with this we will be finished. Number Three, I just passed, actually. Now we're on number four. By the way, before I leave number three, do you notice how fruit bearing is connected to prayer? Fruit bearing, middle of the verse, effective prayer, the end of the verse. How have we deceived ourselves into thinking that the fruit that God wants to bring forth from our lives is going to be accomplished without prayer. What is prayer anyway? It is simply a conversation with God. You speak to Him through prayer. He begins to speak to you primarily through His Word. One of the things that we do as a staff here at this church, we do it every Friday, is we pray for this church. We pray for its direction. We pray for its provision. We pray that God would supernaturally touch the hearts of men and women all over this city that are supposed to be here. And He would draw them supernaturally here. And the first hour of our elder meetings, and I'm embarrassed to say we only pray for an hour. Because Jesus, when He was selecting disciples, did not go out and do a personality inventory. He prayed all night for the direction of God concerning who was to be His hand-picked disciples. But as elders, we are committed to prayer, praying the first half of our elder meeting simply for the needs in this flock. Prayer needs to be a priority in our lives. It needs to be a priority at Sugarland Bible Church just as much as the exposition of the Word is a priority. We cannot, we will not, Produce fruit that lasts without prayer. The fourth benefit that we begin to experience as a result of fulfilling the command by abiding in the love of God is we begin to have a capacity to love one another. You'll notice there in verse 17, Jesus says, This I command you. 
that you love one another. Notice that word command just for a moment. This is not a suggestion. This is not a try this and see if it works approach. This is a command for the Christian that we love each other. And how we wish it read, I want to love the people that are nice to me, Lord. Well, you'd have to rewrite the Bible to get that. It doesn't say that. It simply says to love people regardless of how they treat us. And Jesus, when he keeps saying command, by the way, if you back up to verse 10, he says his commands, his commandments. Verse 12 says that. Verse 17 says that. He keeps saying my command, my commandments. And we ask ourselves, well, Jesus, who do you think you are, God or something? Only God can give commands. Jesus, by giving commands, was indirectly claiming to be who? God. Many ways Jesus claims deity throughout this book. Sometimes he does it overtly, other times he does it more subtly. The commands that Jesus gives are just as real to us as the commands or the commandments came to the children of Israel from Mount Sinai. We talk about the Ten Commandments that God gave to the nation of Israel, and yet Jesus here in Sinai form is giving us these commands that we are to follow, and yet he has given us the empowerment to fulfill those commands. That empowerment comes through simply abiding in him. Well, what are one of those commands, Lord? And the Lord says, I'm so glad you asked. This command, this I command you that you love one another. How do we do that? Why do we do that? Number one, how? How do we develop an ability as God's people to love one another? John 15 and verse 12, a verse that we saw, I believe, last time, gives us the secret. This is the commandment, this is my commandment, that you love one another just as I have loved you. It is a very interesting thing that begins to happen when we abide in the love of God. We begin to mine the height, the width and the depth of God's love for us. We begin to understand that we are loved unconditionally. And then when somebody really irritates me, which seems to happen quite frequently, I'm a little bit less to judge that person. A little less quick to give them a piece of my mind. A little bit more reserved in how I respond to them. Trying to understand why is that person doing what they're doing. Maybe some circumstance in their life has enveloped them, making them a desperate person. And I begin to see people the way God sees them. It's only by abiding in the love of Christ and consequently mining His love for us that gives us a basis or a paradigm for how we treat others. The book of Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 32 says we are to forgive as we have been forgiven. Jesus in Matthew 18 verses 21 through 35 told a whole parable about this. Told about a man that had been forgiven a great sum of money. And consequently he was no longer a candidate for debtor's prison. And then that same man found someone that owed him just a few dollars, a paltry sum. And he demanded, this man that had been forgiven so much, he demanded that that other man who owed him a a minor sum of money be thrown into debtor's prison until every penny was paid. And we look at that man, that second man, and we say, what a hypocrite. How could a man who has been forgiven so much Be so unforgiving. And may I just say to you that that is a microcosm of what many of our lives are like. Through mean-spiritedness, short-temperedness, volatile anger, a spirit of revenge, a gossipy animosity type of spirit, 
How can we act this way when we have been forgiven such a great debt? What hypocrisy we manifest when we act this way. John had been forgiven much, and he became the apostle, known as the apostle of love. As I explained to you last week, he didn't start off on that track. He was one of the sons of thunder who wanted to call down fire from heaven to consume the Samaritans who had rejected the gospel. A man filled with hatred and anger and revenge, and yet that man was transformed into the apostle of love. In fact, John in 1 John 4 and verse 8 later would say, God is love. If anybody understood the love of God, it was John. And the Lord transformed this man's character. How did the Lord do it? The formula is right there in John's Gospel. John tells us over and over again how it happened. It says in John 20 and verse 2, the disciple whom the Lord loved. It says in John 13, verse 23, the disciple whom the Lord loved. It says that over and over again in this book. John did not know much, but he knew that he was unconditionally loved by God. And that changed this man from being a man of venom to a man of grace. That's how it's done. Abiding in Him. Experiencing His love moment by moment. Why? Why love other people? Jesus has already revealed that to us earlier in this book. When He said this, A new commandment that I give you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this all men will know you are my disciples if you love one another. How is the unsaved world supposed to know that this Christian message is true? We think it's because of the size of our buildings or the power of the purse or marketing research or persuasive articulate ability. Those things all have their place. But that is not the argument that the unsaved world is to receive of the authenticity of Jesus Christ. It is the love that God's people have towards one another. That's going to get their attention. How do we do it? Why do we do it? Both answered here. The benefits of abiding in the love of Jesus, fulfilling our purpose, bearing fruit that will last, an effective prayer life, and loving others. It's possible that there is someone here today that doesn't know what it's like to be in the love of God because they have never trusted in Jesus Christ. They might be interested, but they don't know how to get there. And this is why we at this church consistently teach the simple gospel message over and over again. The gospel is simply called good news because He did it all. He died for your sins. And when he died on that cross 2,000 years ago, he had you specifically in mind. Yes, he had the world generically in mind, but he had you in mind as well. And he said when that transaction was finished to Telestai, translated it as finished, paid in full. The debt has been paid. Jesus has risen from the dead thereby authenticating every promise he has ever made. And he leaves the church with a simple message, which is the gospel. The gospel is to trust in what Jesus did for us for our eternity. We are no longer trusting in our works. We're no longer trusting in our denomination. We're no longer trusting in our ability to work harder. We're no longer trusting in what our parents believed, but we're trusting only in him. And that's something that can take place in your life in the quietness of your thoughts and mind and heart as I am speaking. There is but one condition to fulfill, and it is fulfilled through the word believe. As the Holy Spirit places men and women under conviction of their need to trust in Jesus Christ, our exhortation to you is to place your trust exclusively in Jesus Christ. And if that's something you have done or are doing, on the authority of the Word of God, 
you have just transformed your eternal destiny. It's not something you have to raise a hand to do, walk an aisle to do, join a church to do, give money to do. It takes place between you and God in the quietness of one's mind, in the quietness of one's heart. If it's something you want more explanation on, I'm available after the service to talk. Shall we pray? Father, we're grateful for communion. We're grateful for the fellowship lunch that follows. We thank you, Lord, for the provision that we are about to receive. Help it to be a time of sweet fellowship amongst your people around you. Thank you, Lord, for these basic teachings on your love for us and walking in them here in the upper room. Help these things not just to be academic learning for us, but help these things to be reality as we simply seek to abide in you this week and consequently experience great benefits. We'll be careful to give you all the praise and the glory. And God's people said, lunch, uh, like the gospel, is free. So I hope you'll stick around. Even if you didn't bring anything, that's quite all right with us. Now the God of peace who brought up from the dead, the great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the eternal covenant, even Jesus our Lord, equip you in every good thing to do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Minister to someone you don't know on the way out. God bless you. You're dismissed.